as we're talking today about Solomon, I was just noticing the band up here. We're going to talk a little bit about be, becoming white-headed. And uh, I didn't see any of these guys up here with any bl white hair, silver hair. Uh, you may have a little bit, but most of the guys are young. And, you know, at the age that we become, the older we become, the more we have to pour our lives, our ministries, our influence into a generation. Solomon has searched his entire life. He did everything he wanted to do. He was the richest, the most influential, the wisest man who ever lived at the time. And he, he wrote this book called Ecclesiastes. And at the end of the book Ecclesiastes, he says, everything that I've ever done was almost worthless. He called it vanity. Vanity of vanities. And he had a purpose, and he had a searching within his soul. And he, take, he gave us in chapter 12 a challenge, a challenge to understand whether you are old or whether you are young, wherever you are in your mindset of your age, never live your life without God. If you live your life without God, if you try to serve others, if you always try to serve yourself, you're going to lose out on the priority of life and the search or the quest for true happiness, for meaning, will be vague and void if you try to do it without God. But he, anything that we do, anything that we search for, anything that we try to occupy our time with, without God, will become meaningless we will never be able to satisfy the thirst of meaning and purpose. And one question that we all have to ask, and we all will ask one day of our life, what is my meaning? What am I here to do? What is my purpose? We see young people with a strong vitality, a youth that, that's energized and we want to come alongside them and we want, to, we want them to use their gifts and their energy and we want to pour that youth into Christ. We want to see Christ do great and mighty things through a younger generation that when they graduate from high school, they are full in to Christ. We don't want them just to serve the church. We want them to have a bigger meaning than church. We want them to have a meaning for a power and a purpose within God. I love going on mission trips with our teenagers, our college students, because when you see them on purpose, on task, they're in there, they're serving, they're loving God, and they know they're doing it for a bigger picture and a bigger purpose. They want to do it because they love God. See, the reality is we have to understand our mortality. We have to understand that we're all going to die, all of us. And every person in this room, our bodies, our physical body, we have 100% lifetime guarantee on our body. Our body will live and it will die. We cannot invest our bodies for this present world. We must understand that we have a bigger purpose and a bigger plan within our life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, let's start with one, verse 1. There's a lot of stuff here, and we're going to talk a little bit, but we're going to come back down to the conclusion of the matter. Solomon comes to the biggest conclusion of his life. But first one, he says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Solomon put a major priority on our youth. Now, we can all look at a perspective of what youth really is. I do a lot of counseling with, with couples and they get to be about 24, 25, 26 years of age, and now they, they, they know they love each other, and they love God, but they're trying to put this my life together with their life together without God in the center of their life, and it falls apart every time. And when we put God where he needs to be in the pr top priority, remember your creator now. It is a priority to never forget where God is supposed to be on the chain of love and on the priority scale. In the days of your youth. 
Uh, we were just, last night, we thank you, by the way, of everybody that showed up for the fall festival to volunteer. How many of you guys volunteered at the fall festival? Thank you for that. We had over 2,000 kids come through the doors. And, uh, and, and what we wanted to do there is, as we talked to all the volunteers, we wanted the kids to have a great time. We wanted them to have fun. We wanted them to be safe. We wanted them to, to just enjoy. But one thing that we truly wanted, we wanted to get to know the parents. We wanted to get the names for those parents, and Al picked up 250 cards of people that do not go to our church that walked through our doors last night so we could have follow-up, so we could minister, so we could be part of the community in reaching people for the cause of Jesus Christ. So, Al, thank you for that. Thank you for your team. It was a wonderful job. Now we have the big job of following up and doing something about it. Great job. <laughs> I'm gone next week, so great job. <laughs> uh, in, in that, say, uh, we all have, the church all has resources to called Right Now Media. Anybody signed up for Right Now Media? You have to use this Right Now Media thing. I'm going to the Right Now Media conference uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and, and the conference is built on rooted, rooted deep, and it's for the pastors. And how the church will grow is when the leadership descends. When the leadership's roots get deep within the ground and it can provide that health, then the body will grow. The leadership will grow. So we have to root deep and have purpose within our life. You know, as we get older, we might move a little slower. We may have a weakened grip. We may have an unsteady manner to ourselves. We may get a little less um, energy at night and we may go to bed a little early. We may not be able to see quite well Somebody find me my reading glasses. Anybody have to say that? Somebody, you know, what's bad is I used to be able to preach off a 12 font, but now I have to preach off 16 font, and I have to have one contact in, and sometimes that's hilarious. I mean, I'm just getting old, but all those things are reality. Everybody gets old. What we have to do is we have to fall back to the days of our youth and understand exactly what Christ wants for us. Remember your creator. Listen to verses 1 through 8. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up, the sound of a bird and the daughters of the music are brought low. They also, they all afraid of the heights of the terrors in the way. And when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshoppers is a burden and desires fail. For men, God is the eternal home and the mourners go to the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosened, the golden bowl is broken and the pitcher shattered in the fountain and the wheel broken at the well. The dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. In verse 8, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. So what do we have to do? We have to seek God now when we have plenty of life left. We have to seek God now. I talk to a lot of guys that, you know, that are my age. They're, they're 40s and 50s years old, and, and they're pastoring churches and we sit down at these meetings and we talk, say, guys, we have 15 years. We have 20 years. We can't end softly. We must end strong. We have to be able to pass the torch to a growing church, to a younger generation. We have to have a vitality for God. And whether we are 20 years old or 30 years old or 50 years old, we have to live our life pleasing to God now. We can't do it when we are old. We can't do it when we have grandkids. We must do it now in order for us to pass that tor torch. We have to have a, an urgency early in life. Don't wait till the days are numbered. Don't wait till it's almost over. Let's start now. And if we are old, let us look back and pour our life into a generation so when they are living their life, they can emulate us. They can see what a powerful man or a woman of God looks like and acts like. So when we do that, the meaning of life, the meaning of our creator, there are a lot of benefits for starting following Christ at an early age. There's a lot of benefits. I could, I could ask this one question. How many of you guys uh, became a follower of Christ after the age of 30? Raise your hand, after the age of 30. 
And if after the age of 30, you would say, I wish I would have started that when I was 15. I wish I became a follower of Christ in my teenage years because in my teenage years, I had my whole life in front of me. I had my future in front of me. My decisions may have been different. My purpose may have been different because if we serve God at an early age, there's a couple benefits. You're under God's protection at an earlier age. You're under God's protection, and we hear this all the time. God must have a plan for my life. If God didn't have a plan for my life, I would have been dead a long time ago. Things that have taken place a long time ago. And sometimes we, it is less likely to make foolish and bad decisions. Now, not every believer at a young age makes proper decisions. Somebody give me an amen to that. We are all stupid and we all are in the flesh and we all make stupid decisions sometimes, but God loves us and God protects us sometimes even in those bad decisions. But God's strength will empower you through the difficult times. It's awesome to watch youth that have a passion and a love for God. Because a lot of times when we say youth, we're talking to just a younger generation. They, they're not stuck in the stereotypical church where you can't raise your hands, where you can't be authentic. What they care about, if they have a passion and love for God, is genuine, real, authentic love and worship towards God. And when we have a church and we have people that in their youth that they have a passion and love for God, as much as they love God, they have friends that reject God. As much as they go to a school that lifts up God, there are schools that try to reject God and to throw him under the table. What we must do is we must build within our youth a desire and an authenticity and love and passion and knowledge of truth. When we do that, we can have God and work within our life. You know, enjoy life when you are strong before your life declines. Now, our lives are all declining. The moment that you were born, we are dying. But when we get to this age, for me, it was about, my hair started turning white when I was about 40. I was completely black-headed when I became your pastor. So it's all your fault that I'm white-headed now. Because I was, I was 35, I was skinny, and I had black hair. Now I'm fat and white-headed, and I just look at you and say, I don't care if you say anything, it's all your fault. So <laughs> shut it up. Okay. Enjoy life during the pleasant times or the healthy times. We have to enjoy life in the healthy times. Because the older we get, the more serious our health becomes. And the things that we desire to do, we cannot do. The things that we want to do in our minds, we cannot do in our bodies. So we have to take the initiative. When I am healthy, I am going to do what God has called me to do. I am not going to wait on the sidelines. I'm going to do things. It may not be as much as what you used to be able to do, but as long as you are breathing, as long as you have passion, as long as you have love, Solomon said, it's vanity if we do not honor God first. It's vanity. So everything within our life, whether we're young, serve God while we're young so we have our entire life, but when we are getting old and we're all going to die, serve God with all of our breath, with all of our life, with all of our soul. Solomon gives us a wonderful poetic picture of getting old, and I want to share that with you. And it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It says, uh, in the days when the keepers of your house tremble. You know what that is? It's your hands. You know, I, <laughs> Al was making fun of me today because on Sundays, I don't drink a lot of coffee, but on Sundays I had like three or four cups of coffee and I sat in my office and my hands were just going like this. <laughs> He goes, he goes, you get that check out, man. I said, I said it's, just, it's, just, it's just coffee. <laughs> it's just coffee. So it, sometimes we just tremble. And the older we get, the easier it is for our hands to tremble. And the strong men bow down. You know what that is? It's our legs. Our legs. The strong men, the strong bones. Legs. When our grinders cease because they are few. <laughs> We're not even going to go there. Our teeth. And those that look through the window grow dim. Raise my hand. If you have contacts or glasses, raise your hand. Don't you hate those stupid things? My optometrist loves me because he loves what I have to go in there to get that renewal of my contact. 
Because he goes, there's $58, there's $60. He just keeps on chopping up, chopping up, chopping up. But you know, the older we get, our eyes become dim. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when run rises up in the sounds of a bird, that means you don't sleep. Sleep very light. You don't sleep a lot. Like Al, he's my oldest guy I've ever known, but he like wakes up at five o'clock every morning because he can't sleep. So uh, old men can't sleep, okay? <laughs> and then also they are afraid of height and of terrors of the way. That means fear. That means fear. Sometimes the older generation, they can't, the, the fears sometimes overwhelm them. Sometimes driving overwhelms them. Sometimes the terrors of this life is overwhelming and they really do not understand exactly what we need to do or what they should do. So Solomon was telling us sometimes the fear. And when the almond tree blossoms, you know what the almond blossoms as? As a white blossom. So he's saying, he said, white haired old men and white little ladies. That's the blossom. So he said, he's getting this picture. He said, he said, all these things are taking place and we're all going to go through them. And when the almond tree blossoms, he's talking about the white hair. The grasshopper is a burden. Um, they just get very tired of life. Things become a nuisance and we get tired. And desires fail. We can just skip right by there, can't we? And the <laughs> desires fail. For men goes to his eternal home and the mourners go to the streets is death. We're all going to die. The golden years of our body has vanished. Sin, we understand that life is passing by. Now here's what I wanna look at. You look at this younger generation and they look at the top of their hourglass and it is full. And you look at my generation and it's about half full and half empty. But then you look at an older generation, the hourglass on top is getting less and less. Our challenge today, whether your hourglass is full or your hourglass has a little bit of sand left in it, we have to serve God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our emotions till our last sand is gone. We have no, we have no right to say, God, I've done my share. We have no right as a youth to say, let the older generation do their thing. This is God's work. This is God's church. We are God's team. And whether we are young or whether we are old, our purpose is to serve God with all of our heart. Age is not a deterrent to serve God. Whether you are 12 years old, whether you are a band and you have a bunch of teenagers in the band, praise God that the teenagers are serving God. Praise God that our seniors are serving God. We can't deter them. We must encourage them. We must look at them and say, wow, it is not a dead, dying, decaying church. It is a live church, and we must always, even if we don't agree with it, even if we don't like it, we must encourage it because the heart and the soul of the youth is so tender. Every place that they go, they get ridiculed about their faith. They get laughed at about their faith. My generation, you laugh at my faith, laugh all you want. I am not gonna take it personal that you don't love my Jesus. I love my Jesus, my Jesus saved me. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I feel sorry for you, but I am not going to lose who I am because of your lack of faith. But a teenager, a teenager that really has no security, a teenager that wonders what it's all about, a teenager that's walking through their faith with people's help, and somebody with influence and power and prestige hurts them and, and corrects them and belittles them, it's very easy for a youth to fall under the table, to hide, to not stand up. But when they come to the house of God, when they come to the church house, what we must do is we must say, great job. We must say, Jesus is worth everything that you do, every person that you love. Enjoy life with God before it's too late. Remember your creator before the silver cord loosens and the golden bowl is broken, but the picture is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. When the dust will return to earth, it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. 
And he says, vanity is vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Death is inevitable. Death is inevitable. It is one of the saddest things that we go through, whether it is a casket of a five-year-old child or death of a 75-year-old saint. It is very sad. We have to comfort. We have to give hope. We have to encourage. But one of the things that Solomon is saying here, he's saying, if you don't love God, we will mourn your death. But when you love God, we can celebrate your death. Death is inevitable. In the presence of heaven with God. Or in the presence of absence of God. Or we could put it this way in old school language. Either you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. What is the deciding factor? The deciding factor of whether you're gaining access to God or the absence of God is you're present with Jesus. And when we have given our life to Christ, it is the common denominator to understand death is inevitable and the destination can be sure. Without God, it's all vanity. Without God, you're trading in the 70 years of life for an eternity of absence of God. But we can also trade this 70 years in of the presence of God, the peace of God, and the future with God. We can't cast our 70 years to the dirt and not make a purpose out of it. Without God, life is meaningless. We have to say God first, self off the throne, and God on the throne. Self, when we put self in charge, we fail. We put a lot of things in with self, and that flesh likes a lot of different things. We can start listing the things that when we put God on the sideline, and we put self on the throne. The things that we experience, the joys that we try to obtain, the things that we go through are vanities. Oh, maybe okay for a fun time. We can rent sin for a season. And we can say that was a blast. But anything that we do without God in the center will soon become calamity. The thing that we thirst will soon control us. The things that we desire without God in the center of it will control everything that we do. We must put God where he needs to be. John chapter 3 verse 36 is a powerful, powerful verse. If you had one verse at your disposal and you wanted to find out about heaven or hell, this one verse is the verse that you could communicate and this is God's word. It says this, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath, the blessing of God is heaven. The wrath of God is the absence of the presence of God for an eternity in hell. And those that believe in God will experience heaven, and those that do not will experience hell. How would your thoughts be different? If that reality was ingrained within our heart, that we know that God loves us, that we know that we're going to serve him, here's what would be different. We would have, we would have peace and we would not have fear. We would be cautious of how we act towards others because we also know that we show God that we love him by loving others. A sense of fulfillment when we serve God. Satisfied with God instead of looking to be satisfied with things. When we look at what satisfies us, we can be satisfied with the power of God. We don't deserve anything God gives to us because Jesus, Jesus gave us everything. His conclusion in life is vanity without Christ. Vanity without Christ. You know, when we think about um, people smarter than you, uh, people that are better than you at certain things, you can always look at somebody and say, you know, uh, they do that so much better than I can. They do this so much better than I can. And I think about um, how many of you guys have smartphones? Anybody over 25 have a smartphone? And your smartphone breaks, who do you give it to? Your kids, okay? Stinking kids. They open up, they, there you go, Dad. How do I do that? Dad, I don't want to tell you. I just, I'll just do it for you. 
They're smart. They're, they're incredibly smart. But sometimes we have to say, I am not as good in this area as you are. And encourage them to do what they are good at. Encourage them to be who they need to be. And it may not just be with your smartphone. It may be with life. It may be that we must surround ourselves with people that are smarter, more godly, stronger in certain areas than we are. There's times in our life that we must be humbled so God can be glorified. So here's where we're going. Revere God. The whole duty of man is to revere God. What does revere God mean? Just respect. There's a song that is sung, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. In other words, I, when I look in the presence of God, I am absolutely nothing compared to the awe, power, and respect of God. You know, one of the greatest things about heaven is going to be this. It's going to be the part of God. We have a speck of God within us right now, part of the Godhead. It's called the, the Holy Spirit. But when we close our eyes and we take our last breath, we are going to experience something that we can't even comprehend. We are going to experience the fullness of God. We are going to experience Jesus, the redemptive plan of God for our salvation. We're going to experience God. We're going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit when we close our eyes, our bodies in this temporal body could not handle the power of the Holy Spirit fully manifested itself in front of us. When we think about what we're going to have, when we think about what we are going to gain, we are going to gain the presence of God. Not just talk about it, not just read his word, experience God. We can't fathom that. We think singing a couple songs on Sunday morning is worshiping. We think as long as we like the songs, I'll raise my hands and I'll bow my hands. But you know what? When we're talking about worship, worship is not singing a song. Worship is experiencing God. And when we can experience God, we can understand what God has done for us. And we can understand the redemptive plan. And we can understand that I am nothing without God. We understand that the Holy Spirit works within my life. That is worship. That, I can bow my head low. I can close my eyes. I can experience God. That is worship. Not whether I like a song. It's whether I love God. And if I respect God and I have fear of God, I can learn to absolutely trust in his presence, his direction, his power, and his word. I learn the truth of God's wisdom. Share what you learn from others. In verse nine it says, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he, pon he pondered and sought out and said in order many proverbs. Share what you've learned with others. Help others in truth with the right spirit. Not you are truth. Jesus is truth. Not that you are better because you have the truth. No, because Jesus wants to forgive you because he's offering you truth. Anytime a Christian thinks they are better than the unsaved world, we have lost the opportunity to bring them to Christ. We must be humbled about what God has done for us. And once we have become humbled in what Christ has done for us, the unsaved world will see that we are genuine in our faith, not arrogant of our faith. And any time that we become arrogant of our faith, the love of God is not being shown through us. We are sinning as a believer when we have arrogance in our hearts. And we've seen it. And the unsaved world is looking at us and say, what in the world is all that about? What difference do you have than I have? And we could talk about Jesus all day long. We could talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. But the, evident, the evidence of Jesus being our Lord is the attitude and the action of love throughout our life. You shall know that you're my disciple when you have love one for another. And as a young man, 
We must teach them and love them and help them. And then in verse seven, I'm sorry, verse 11, it says, the words of the wise are like goads and the words of the scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd, by one shepherd. Well-driven nails, it's, it's, uh, the illustration would be twofold. It would be like the, the tent stakes, the nails that you put into the ground to hold the structure together is one of the illustrations. And the other illustration is the preacher. The proclaimer of the message is it's like a plow. And that stake goes deep into the hard, rocky ground. And it's like a plow and it's furled and it's brought over. It softens it and it's brought over and it lets the air get to it. And when the word of God is planted on fertile soil, it can take root. And as the preacher, as the proclaimer of the message, it's like that tent peg. It's like that knife that goes in and it softens it so the word of God can be planted, well-driven. Nails hold up the tent or it is allowed to be um, planted. But I like what he says, given by one shepherd. One shepherd. You know who in the, who's the head of the church? Who's the head of Glenville Baptist Church? Jesus. He is our shepherd. He is our Lord. Our, our word, God's word, is not up for discussion. If I say, you know what, I, I, I don't like what it says here. I like what this book says. And I say, guys, close your Bibles today. Let's open up another book. Let me proclaim out of that other book. You may put up with that for about a week or two. But you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna say, you know what, if he doesn't preach the Bible, I am out of here. Because any other book is opinions of man. But God's word is God's holy word, and it will never fail. John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In John chapter one, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that we beheld his glory, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of God is the only thing that we have to stand on. As a believer, as somebody that is growing up, as a young generation to an older generation, there's one thing that we hold on to, and that is the power and the love of Jesus. He became man. He died on the cross for our sins. Verse 12, and further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. In other words, he's saying, if, if you're reading books, if you're studying, and they're contrary to God's word, it's wearisome to try to debate over the word of God. We must have truth. We must have faith. We must have guidance by the Holy Spirit. It gets wearisome. Self-help books will never change a life like Christ can. We may need to know other things. We have to know certain things, but it has to be baptized by God's word and what God's purpose is. And revere God and obey is the essence of truth. Revere, respect, and obey. Verse 13, it says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. Fear God and keep his commandments. In John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The opposite of that would be, if you don't keep my commandments, you probably don't love me. And as God's family, what we must do is we must have the awe of God. It's easy to love the lovable, but it's very difficult to love the unlovable. And the difference to love the unlovable is we have to love through Christ. We have to see them as what God needs them to be, a saved, bought, blood, saint of God. That's how we have to do it. The meaning of life flows from the reverence of God. Every person has been hurt. Every dream has been dashed. Every hurt is deep and every scar is real. But what we have to do is we have to look deep. The visions and the hopes and the dreams of a younger generation. We have to look at that and we have to kindle that. We have to hold that and very delicately say, I want to do everything I can as the older generation to love, to encourage, to inspire, to give to our kids 
our grandkids a purpose. We have to teach them what is the meaning of life. Sometimes we're going to have to have some hard discussions. Sometimes they may not agree with you. Sometimes they may test you. Sometimes they may even challenge you. But you know what? If we do not have the answers for ourselves, and if our life does not live our v values and our, and our convictions ourselves, how can we articulate what we do not live? How can we say one thing in our life and do not live verbally, communicate the same thing? What we must do is we must love the unlovable. We must choose to be a mentor. The meaning of life flows from the reverence of God. Like I said, every person has been broken because of some reason. We have this many people in this room. We could line up here and you could tell me and tell this audience a time in your life that your dream was dashed, your vision was spoiled, the pain was overwhelming, a time where you needed God, a time that you were broken to a point that you didn't know if even God was around or if anybody cared. But somebody, something came alongside you. The Holy Spirit energized you. And you fell on your face before God and you say, Lord, I need you. And God came alongside you like only he can. And he helped you. Now your vision may be different. Your goal may be different. The purpose of your life may have changed. But God's hand has not. When I love others, they will know it. But more importantly, when I love others, God knows it. My job and your job is to honor God. Stand ultimately accountable before God. In verse 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now I want to talk to you about uh, a dispensation, uh, a time period. Solomon is in the Old Testament. His theology is correct that we will stand before God. But let me give you the beautiful part. And this is uh, so important. We will stand before God. But many of you have already stood before God. Many of you stood before God and you bowed your knees and you said, Lord, I need you. Forgive me. And when we stood our faces before God and we were broken of our sin, Jesus wrapped his arms around us. He baptized us with his blood that he shed upon the cross and he saved us. We are saved because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We did stand before God and we will stand before God. But when God looks at the believer, he is not looking at you with condemnation. He's looking at you through salvation. And when he looks to you through salvation, it's not what you have done. It's what Jesus did. And when we love God and respect God and have an awe for God, it's because we know what Jesus did. We know that he died on the cross. We know that my sin has been forgiven. We know my past has been forgiven. Let me say that again. Our past has been forgiven by God. We must forgive our past. Our present is forgiven by God because of the love that he shed on the cross for you and the future has been forgiven. We will stand before God and we will be humbled. We are going to stand before almighty creator of this world, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we are not going to look at him and say, why did this take place? We're not going to look at him and get upset at him because something took place. We're going to look at him and say, I am so happy. These 70 years are gone. I wish I could have been here 60 years ago. And we're going to stand before God with a focus and a reverence that only a broken, contrite heart could have. And we're going to bow our face before him. And we're going to join the elders and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That is true worship. That is a generation, folks, that we have to teach our kids. We have to say, 
it is going to be well worth it to have the purpose of life. If you do not put God where he needs to be, it's vanity. It's vanity. It's silliness. It's a waste of time. You will never come out on the other end because you're focused on self. Solomon did that for his entire life. And he said the conclusion of the whole matter is this. Put God where he needs to be. And everything else falls into place. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. That means God's going to be with you in the midst of your fights and your struggles and your love. You shall know you're my disciple if you have love one for another. Love one for another. That's very difficult because we all have relational struggles. We all have issues. And I believe that Jesus puts it down to a very fine point. Love your God with all your soul, heart, and your emotion. Love God with everything you have. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. When you can put those two things together and all the laws and all the prophets are commanded on these two things, God is a very relational God. And he wants to restore that broken relationship with you and others and with you and God. If you have that broken relationship, if you have animosity within your heart towards a brother, a family member, if you have issue towards God and you need Jesus to forgive you, we're going to have a time of invitation where God wants to restore he is in the reconciliation business. He wants to bring two things that have been broken apart, a relationship with others and a relationship with God, and he wants to reconcile that, bring it together, and to forgive and to move on. There's not a greater attribute of God than reconciliation, bringing two things together that have been broken. And you may not be able to bring both together. You may have one side, but you may have to ask God to get my side correct you may have to ask God to forgive you of your issue, and then God will work on that other issue. It has to start with you. You can't make somebody forgive you. You can only forgive yourself, and you can get up and say, I need God to work. I need God to bring this thing to pass. I need God to work within my life. And when we can do that, we are teaching a younger generation. It's not about vanity. It's not about vanity. It's about putting God where God needs to be and let God do his work, and God does it better than any man. Anyone, anything, we have to put God first in every part of our life. Will you please stand to your feet? And we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to sing a song. This invitation is for you. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, we'll do that. If you'd like to pray by yourself, you're more than welcome to. God hears our prayers. Dear Father, Lord, be